So would you please welcome John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin. Wir werden jetzt natürlich Englisch miteinander reden, aber falls jemand nachher etwas fragen will, auf Deutsch, ich kann es übersetzen, oder auch Dick, der später dazukommt, der kann es bestimmt noch besser übersetzen. I like that jacket. Thank you very much. I mean, I know you told me this afternoon you got this special jacket, but a little bit of a spark. I'm going to start with a few fairly banal questions, because I think often the answers you get to those are very interesting. Now, we just watched that whole concert like we were there. You were in a restaurant, you've just arrived. Can you tell us what went through your heads and what you said to each other when you came off stage, when that concert finished? We did it. <laughs> it was, uh, as you can imagine, it was quite an evening. Um, there was a lot building up to that evening, and uh, there was just the one show, and so uh, we had to, like, more than get it right. And I think we did. We'll talk about the whole build up to the show itself in a minute, but if we could talk specifically about the day of the concert. Because I can imagine there were interesting things going on before you got to the arena, when you met up, how you decided what you were going to do. Can you give us a rough idea of how that day went before you ended up on stage? Well, I decided I should chill as much as I could, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, we'd done some uh, a, a dress rehearsal a few days before, and that had gone well, so I wasn't anxious about perhaps it not working. I knew it would work. It's just how well would work. it would work was, was the thing. And uh, I took it very easy during the day. I played a little banjo. <laughs> and um, uh, just, be, you know, very good. we actually went there by boat because it's, uh, the O2 arena is, is right on the docklands. And it's fantastic. We, uh, we got a car down to Chelsea Harbour. And then um, we were in this, these ribs, I don't know how that translates, but these very fast boats at night on the River Thames. And it's, it was 20 minutes from Chelsea to Greenwich. And that's a long way, so that's going about 40 miles an hour at night. It was just the, the best way to arrive at this huge dome, you know, with the lights. And uh, it was, it's, so it's an exciting arrival, that's for sure. How long did you get there before the concert started? Oh, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, about an hour and a half, I think, at the most. Was that the most difficult time, though, that hour and a half before you went out there? Um, no, you kind of... Uh, you kind of caffeinate. <laughs> but not too much. You don't want to be shaking. But uh, you don't want to be too relaxed, either. <laughs> Was there that feeling, though, that, hey, this was probably going to be the last time that we perform together and play these songs? Was that in your mind in any way, at any point, before, during, after? Uh, no, actually it wasn't. And in fact, during, <laughs> during the show, I remember playing something, I think, in, um, in No Quarter. And as you do as you're a musician, of course you're concentrating on the music, but there's also this other little thing going on, and was it the left or the right side of the brain, I can never remember, which is actually taking stock and making notes and things. And I remember making a note to myself, do not do that tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go, oh, another part of my brain said, you stupid is. <laughs> 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 
we talked a bit this afternoon, and it was quite interesting because I was asking him about making mistakes. And I said, you know, if you take a concert like Cream's Reunion, they played over four or five days, so if there were any mistakes, they could cut them out and rearrange things. And he said, well, no, we only had the one night, but actually, we didn't really make any mistakes. That's true, right? You had that feeling all the way through. This is just working. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you try never to make mistakes. <laughs> but things inevitably go, you know, you, you slip now and again. But um, fortunately, our, uh, our rate of slippage was extremely low that <laughs> night. We were, you know, we were, when it's really driving through and going well, you'd be surprised how few mistakes you actually do make. 20 million people wanted tickets to go to that concert. I don't know how many eventually turned out, but it was obviously a huge arena uh, with a big stage. But the interesting thing is that you're very tight on that stage. You're not using the whole width of the stage. The band is very, very close together. Why was that? That's the way we've always done it. Um, as you probably noticed, and um, um, probably never noticed before because it's hard to see, especially in the, uh, when we started playing larger stadiums, but the band is always uh, making eye contact and, and interacting in, as well as listening and, and paying attention and focusing. You're always watching and, and you need to be close to each other. But it probably comes from the, from the days when we played in stages which were about sort of from there <laughs> to there. And just because the stages got bigger, we never moved up. <laughs> You like to be in front of the drums as well. I actually like to feel the, you know, feel the bass drum, the wind from the bass drum. And, and that, that's where you make the best music, you know, when you're close together. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, you're close together as well, in, in as much as it's not just standing close together on stage. It was very obvious the intimacy between the four of you when you're working on stage. Now I'm wondering what the intimacy was like when it came to putting the whole thing together. When you start planning for that concert, you've obviously, as, as Robert Plant at one point says, okay, we, we've got ten albums to choose from here. What are we going to play? Which order are we going to play them in? Can you give us a rough idea of how that came about? Which songs are we going to play? Were there arguments about that? You wanted one, they didn't want one, whoever. Generally, we've always known, I mean, and this goes through the music making, it goes through everything that we ever did. We always know what's good for the band. Um, when you're playing, you don't play to make yourself sound good. You, make, you, you play to make the band sound good. So if it means playing lots of notes and the band sounds good, that's good. If it play, means playing very few notes, then as long as the band sounds good. You know, that, that's the whole point. So when we were making the... Um, uh, the set list out, all we had to do really was decide how to start. And um, I can't remember, I think I might have suggested good times, bad times, which in retrospect was a bit of a mistake because it's bloody hard to play when you walk out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise, oh yes, I wrote this riff. Oh. <laughs> what am I? But once we'd started, and then, as you say, we have to include certain things. You have to have stairway, you have to have cashmere, and you have to have trample and thought, and, um, and um, a quarter. <laughs> um, and so it was just a matter of fitting them in so that they would, there would be a, um, a trajectory, there would be a, a shape to the show, which we've always done. When we first went to America, we came upon the sort of hippie music scene where you know, they'd be playing, and you finish a song and they'd wander around the stage. <laughs> you know, and then, and you, and there, there would be zero energy. And when we first hit America, we were just like, bang, 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 bang. You'd see people going, what the? <laughs> you know. and, and then we would, <laughs> we would actually build, build, Build the show, you know, so that it had a shape, you know, it had a high and then it would dip down and you'd let people rest for a little bit and then kick them right up the arse again, you know. <laughs> and we always do that and we know how to do it as well. And so there's no real argument, there's discussion. You say maybe this one is, and somebody will suggest another song. I think Jimmy suggested, let's do For Your Life. Right? 
oh yeah, we've never actually done that, have we? No, oh, let's do that. And where can we put it so that it, it's most effective and it's, you know, so it's, it's all that sort of stuff. I was going to ask you about that because that's the only song, I think, that you'd never performed live before. Were there other songs that you considered performing live that you hadn't done before? Um, mm, well, well, actually, Good Times, Bad Times haven't been on. I don't think we've done that on stage, but we might have. I'm sure somebody will correct me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have. Always, that, yeah. Yes, I know. Um, well, I don't know, yeah. Um, for Your Life, of course, I've actually forgotten that we hadn't played it live. Because when you're recording it, live recording, it's still a performance. Um, I remember coming to the end of it and looking at Jim and going, how do we finish this? How do we finish this on stage? Went, You've never done it on stage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, with some of the other songs, of course, uh, we've done many different versions and different, uh, different ways of beginning and ending. And um, there become a time when you be playing a song and you go, how do we do this? How do we finish this one? And we'd all look at Jason and he'd go, well, 1971, you did it this way. 1973, however, <laughs> 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 it this. So it's different. You know, he has this encyclopedic knowledge. You know, Google Bonham. <laughs> 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 Anything you want to know about that, you can ask Jason. So when you come back to these songs, and the interesting thing is that you've all been doing different things, particularly you and, and Robert have done lots of different things leading up to this concert. We'll come on in a minute to why it took five years to release the film, but before 2007 when the concert took place, you were both involved in lots of different kinds of things, very, very different to what Led Zeppelin do. The amazing thing is that when you see this concert, it's like no time has passed at all. Everything is there. Like you were saying when you went to America and it's bang, bang, bang. It was exactly like that. I when you got back to rehearse, did it click immediately or did it take a bit of time? It clicked immediately. As soon as we start playing together, I mean, you might, we might not have spoken for a while with each other. And, and even then it's like, ah, oh, how are you doing? But it's, you know, you know what it's like when you haven't seen someone for a long, long time, or, or you see them sporadically or in different circumstances. Um, it's not as easy as when you actually pick up an instrument and start playing, and then it just, it just falls straight back into it. It's almost as if you, know, you were playing a show two weeks before. We should talk about why this concert took place when it did. I mean, I know that back in 1988, you did a concert in Madison Square Garden in New York. I remember this because I was presenting it on TV and we had all kinds of problems getting a live stream from America. But that was to celebrate Atlantic Records' 40th anniversary. And Robert mentions, I think, Ahmed Erdogan three times at least uh, during the concert. Can you tell me a bit about the, the reason for that and the meaning that he had to the whole band, basically? Well, when we made our first record and we were looking to sign to a label, we all, we all, we, we discussed it and we all really wanted to sign with Atlantic. Um, there was just something about it, especially for us, us white soul boys. <laughs> we really wanted to be with this. You know, it's, it's had this magic aura, Atlantic Records, of all the R&B and for me the jazz. And um, I think it might have been Jerry Wexler that actually first signed us. Um, but then Ahmet soon took us under his wing, and uh, it was like a kindred, kindred spirit. You know, he, he produced all the records that we were in awe of, and it clicked immediately, and plus we all seemed to like the same entertainment. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got to answer that question. No, no, right? sorry. sorry I, I didn't say that to <laughs> Leave it up to your imagination. <laughs> Um, but yes, yes, we were very close with Ahmet. He was, he was a friend. He wasn't a record ex he was more than a record executive, much more, much, much more. <laughs> friend and confidant. But the interesting thing is, I mean, I know the band has been offered huge amounts of money to go on tour again. You've refused to do that. But he is a person that sort of, for whatever reason, has over periods of time managed to bring you back together, it seems. So there's obviously, there's a very, very deep link to him as a person as well, not just as someone that worked for Atlantic Radio. Yes, yes, that, that's absolutely true. Um, 
I mean, he was just a music man through and through. Um, he recorded Benny King and I mean, just Ray Charles and Charles Mingus, for goodness sake. Uh, that was, you know, he was our kind of man. He was just, he was in it for the music. Let's go back to the beginning of the, well, the preparation for the concert in the sense of when did you first decide we're going to do this? And under what circumstances? Did you all sit down together? Who came up with the idea originally? Um, I think it kind of grew. Um, I think we did, I think we did a benefit for Arnett originally. So I played with Benny King. And I think after that, Robert, it was Robert's idea originally, I think he wanted to do something in England for Ahmed. And it was going to be a variety of artists and maybe we were going to do one song or something, two songs, and then three songs, and then I said, wait a minute, we can't just go and do three songs. And suddenly it's, what you see there, it just grew and grew and grew. It took five years to get the film finally out. We'll talk with Dick in a minute, maybe a little bit about that. And I think that he came very late to the project anyway, because it seems to be one of these things that developed its own dynamic. You hadn't intended necessarily to record it or to film it, but that sort of came one after another. Can you give us an idea of where you finally said, hey, we should film this? This is Because it is a historic document now. Well, the, the focus was the show to do the show, to do the one show in celebration of Arnett's life. And that was, everything was for that show. But then I thought, well, we've got to record it, obviously. We've got to record it. And then we thought, well, we've got to film it too. <laughs> and we've got to film it properly. And Dick came in with all this demand, all these cameras, all the European women, and he could do it. <laughs> but then he convinced us that we should do it properly, and I'm bloody glad he did. <laughs> because uh, the one thing about in the days that, that we started, nobody really filmed anything. Consequently, there's bugger all about Zeppelin on film. You know, there's just that the song remains the same, and a Danish TV, and that's almost about it. Maybe bits of other concerts. And so we thought it would be criminal not to just do it properly. But we weren't going to we weren't going to think about it at all. We were just going to concentrate on the live show and um, and leave the rest in the capable hands of uh, Mr. Carruthers and uh, others. The bass player finally got into the light as well, because you were saying to me earlier, the problem <laughs> in the old days with filming stuff was the bass player was always in the shadows. It was only the singer and the guitar player. Yeah, well, the bass player and the drummer, the rhythm section, people must have wondered where all that noise was coming from. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> all you see these both bouncing around the front. <laughs> and there's this stonking stuff coming in, you know, so. But, but I figured it out. Actually, what happened was that in the old days, nobody had any light. When we first started, nobody had any light. And then as we played larger places, they'd kind of put spots on the people that they could see moving. And in the end, it just grew and grew and grew, and we just got darker and darker and darker. <laughs> but finally, again thanks to Mr. Carruthers, <laughs> I got some light. And, uh, let's, bring, let's bring it up. Um, we'll have you speak in English this time, Dick, okay? I mean, the German was amazing at the oh, beginning. I, thought, I was really <laughs> impressed, you know. I was really very, very impressed. But we'll, we'll keep it to English now, if you like. Unless you want to speak in French, maybe. No <laughs> Tell me about how you got involved. Uh, well, um, as John said, it was always about the gig. And uh, I was... Um, uh, recruited to, to shoot the show for the big screen. I remember at the very first big meeting we went to secretively in the uh, hotel, um, the band had been to see an Elton John show, and uh, Elton John, it was the red piano, I think, right? And he had a huge screen. I said, oh yeah, we want a great big screen like Fat Reg. 
you know, we've got to have uh, a bigger screen than that, we'll let's have it. Fat uh, Yeah, that works. As, as, as Elton's affectionately known. And, um... <laughs> um so that was it, and that was the first thing I think was saying, well, if you know, this is Led Zeppelin, it's going to be this fantastic historic occasion. If we're going to do this properly and make the set the screen, we need to populate it with great videos. We need a lot of cameras. We need a lot of special effects. We need all of that. And that. they were fantastic in encouraging me, where because I'm just a child with toys, I said, oh, I've got this great desk. We can do all these effects, and we can do it all live. Do you want to go for it? And um, they were absolutely all, uh, absolutely all for it. There was no kind of don't get too close, don't shoot this, don't do that, don't modernise it, don't make it. But none of that. Quite the opposite. It's like show what we're playing, go for the effects, make it new, make it a master of technology, make it make it enhance and punctuate and work with the music, but but be unique and, and uh, so from from the, the leap from that I don't think I'm answering, I'm answering your question exactly but the leap from doing that to actually putting it all uh, into a recording was was a, a relatively small leap. Great job! <laughs> Great job! <laughs> How dare you do when you were on stage of it being filmed? Was that something that once you got on stage it disappeared completely from your mind? Yeah, somebody actually did ask me that. You know, didn't the cameras put you on? I went, what cameras? I mean, you just don't see anything when it's... There's a lot to do on stage. It was a show. There's a lot to listen to and a lot to pay attention to because it moves awfully quickly. And, uh, and I didn't notice the cameras at all until I saw, saw the film and went, oh, look, there's cameras everywhere. Which is, you know, again, well done. Thank you. I, I, I do... Pride myself. The guys that were on stage, um, if they ever, Jimmy, Lam, and uh, John, we shot hundreds and hundreds of shows together going back to the mid 90s, and they know exactly what they're doing, exactly what they want, and how to hide behind amplifiers, hide behind the drums, when to jump out and to that. I think, you know, you've seen the film now. I, I, I do genuinely pride myself on that you can hardly ever see them. Um, you know, they're there occasionally, you can't pretend they're not, but they're, they, they never get in the way. Unlike certain films. How, how did you get that shot of my feet? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't reveal everything, John, you know, but um, I, I was a... Uh, Spider cam. Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was actually a robot cam. It was a robot camera, but uh, I'm very pleased that we got the shots of your feet, because I think there was somebody... Um, Somebody had mentioned to me, you know, that... that uh, nice boots! Is, well, yes, nice boots, but <laughs> again, I was the same as a fan of Led Zeppelin when I was uh, just listening to the albums. You'd think, who plays the bass? <laughs> well, actually, that, funny enough, not to drop a name, but Paul McCartney <laughs> <laughs> was at the London premiere. He was. And he said to me, I can hear a bass. I said, where is it coming from? He said, my feet. <laughs> He looked at me like I was crazy. Yes. But then, then he understood. When you saw the picture, funny enough, just after that came the picture. Oh, yeah, yeah that's how you do it. I said, well, no other butler will play bass. Right? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's where, that's where really good shoes. You know, we mentioned the jacket, but have you seen these shoes here? Well, they might get filmed, you know. These shoes, but you're not, you can't really see them, you're not close enough, but they when he goes out, when he goes by, have a look at those shoes. They, they really are very There's special. rhythm in them, their shoes. There definitely is rhythm in them, their shoes. <laughs> Let me ask you um, a couple of things about the aesthetics of the film, because I mean, there's a couple of things that struck me instantly having seen it. I think the first time we see a close-up of anybody in the audience is about nobody's fault but mine. And after that, there aren't a lot more. There's one at the end of Stairway to Heaven, and there's a couple of others which is fairly unusual these days for concert films. I mean, people tend to always, you know, the audience is singing along, they know all the words and everything. Was that a decision you made right from the beginning, or was that when you were editing, you thought, no, this is about the band. The audience is there, but this is, this is the band room. It became very obvious in the editing stage. We certainly had a lot of audience, great audience shots, you know, as I got the guys to shoot them. Um, but if you just think about it numerically, we had... Of, say you've got 12 usable shots at any one point in time, a shot of the crowd singing along, I've probably got six or seven other shots of what these guys are doing. So it's never going to be the best shot to use. And 
on a more philosophical uh, sort of narrative sense, um, the constant affirmation that you get with a, a concert film of a crowd really enjoying themselves. You know, there are certain bands where that, that's what we want to see that constant affirmation. Um, that's, that's like on page seven of a Led Zeppelin concert. What you want to see is what they're doing and how they're playing and how they're communicating and getting completely absorbed into that. And think, oh yeah, there's a crowd, they're loving it, yeah. But I'm really interested <laughs> in it. So yeah, we cut to it in between songs, they applaud, you know they're there, that's it. It doesn't use a lot of effects. There's the occasional stop which fits to the, to the rhythm of the songs. There's the odd little slow motion which I thought really worked. And then, of course, there's what people have called the Instagram effect, if you like, um, which is used a lot throughout the whole yes. film. And again, that's something that would really interest me. Did you want to do that before? Is that something to do with modern day technology? Because like, everybody's filming and they're going to put it on YouTube as soon as we're finished. Where did that come from? And was it difficult once you started to, to not you know, answer carry these on questions one at a time? Um, They're all <laughs> kind of the same question. Are, I'm just sort um, of beating around the bush. Here. No, it's fine. It's something. It's a stylistic thing. What it is is, in fact, Super 8. I'm a big fan of using Super 8. Um, it, I think it's a beautiful texture. It sits in counterpoint to the cleanness of HD, and. Um, it, it's something that I have experimented with before. In fact, I remember giving John and Jimmy a copy of a film that I did with the White Stripes, which was shot entirely on Super 8, where there with the White Stripes, the, the texture and the graininess of Super 8 is, is, a, is a perfect visual metaphor for their sound. So um, inspired it may have been, but actually when you think about it, shooting the White Stripes on Super 8 is very obvious, but that's going to work perfectly. So uh, I remember in rehearsals, once this decision was, okay, let's get it in the can, but let's not do it too obviously or make it the, the primary motivator. I said, well, how about we put a couple of Super 8 cameras in the crowd, right? We, it, it will give it a bootleg feel. It will give it a kind of a crunchy textual counterpoint. It will be something that I can cut in where it works musically and stylistically and that's uh, I hope exactly what we've done in fact in the edit the, what you saw where we we don't expand it full frame sometimes we do sometimes we do in fact if you notice it I would say we've kind of failed I think it should be almost subliminal it, 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 it's a different thing as if you're sort of changing your perspective and changing back again and sometimes it's full frame sometimes it isn't um, but uh, I think I think it works I think it, it's a little a counterpoint We've mentioned, John, that it took five years for the film to come out. There could be various reasons for that, but I'd be interested to know from you, what input did you have into the film and the other guys in the band, obviously, after it had been shot when it comes to editing? Were you really involved with, with Dick when it came to putting the film together, or did you leave that more to him? Um, yeah, once, once we realised, we, we checked checked up on him quite a bit. <laughs> But he did all the yeah he, he did all the work pretty much, and then called us up and said come out of this come out of this, and we go look at look at that and go yeah shit. <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, it turned into something wondrous. I know that you've said previously at a press conference a couple of weeks ago when you were asked about this five years, the Led Zeppelin five years is like five minutes, it goes past really really quickly. Um, but there must be more to it than that. Five years, I mean, why did it take so long? Well, I mean, we're not a band anymore. We're three individuals, and um, all with individual people. And sometimes the lines of communication tend to drift. <laughs> it's about as much as I can say, really. It's just, it's hard getting it all together. I mean, it always was. Zeppelin always used to, when you can actually get us all together, we can make a decision in, like, just like that. <laughs> but actually getting us all together is really, really difficult, apart from geographically, just, you know, it's just, it's hard, and things just take a long time. What was the hardest thing for you as far as this project was concerned? Yeah. That's a good question. I think the hardest thing was Yeah. He's listening. I think getting the balance right, where no matter how well shot it was, um, I say so myself, still doing justice to the amazing 
phenomenal force that is Led Zeppelin Live. Even with that many cameras and that, that much uh, time and expertise at our hands, to, to fine tune it, there's a process of editing where it looks not very, you, you spend weeks and months and it actually looks worse than where you started because you tip everything into it and stir it all up and it doesn't quite work and that's the time that you need the courage to show it to everybody and say look I know this isn't very good at this point but it sort of shows stylistically where we're trying to get to does this, you know you're dealing with some incredible musicians and quite different personalities that have a different take on what the music is that they're playing the emphasis for them necessarily is different and so you've got to balance that in a visual narrative and get it right. And that's, uh, that's a bit of a time break. Let me open it up because I'm sure there are people sitting here that have got questions. So, yeah. Hello. Hello, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones. I'm very um, pleased to have seen the film. And I'm a musician myself. And I, I have to tell you that watching it, I get a sense of sensation looking at the interaction between all of you. And that it's, it's quite obvious that all of you seem to know that this is the one off. This is the one time you actually will perform. That this is such is the impression. Now my question is, was that clear from the get-go that it would be a one-off? And if it was, how or if it wasn't, how did you resist any impulse to wanting to do it again? Um, it was always. It was always decided to be that one show. Um, there was, we didn't even want to think about what might or might not happen afterwards. Um, as far as being on stage and thinking that, there was no, there's no thought about that at all. Basically, you concentrate on the music and you do the best you can, and that's what all that. You're not thinking about anything, anything that you were saying when you're on the stage. It's the music, the music, the music. And that was the fact that you said earlier, I'll do that different tomorrow. Oh yeah, yeah, but that's part of the music. <laughs> so yeah. exactly. But, it's, but it's, especially your points are incredibly complex, such as the footwork and the handwork. So, I mean, to, to, really, to really do that for one, just one time, I mean, can, just as a musician, can you just sort of switch your finger and, and get back into that? Sure. Uh, ten years after, how long had you, had you not played? Well, that's what I do. I'm a musician. You're a musician, you can do it. But there's one time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, my name is Percival. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I live here. I want to say there was very few bands uh, when I grew up that touched me. And I was a little, I was like five or six when music like, just started to change my life. Led Zeppelin was the only band then. Thank you so fucking much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Because, because of you guys letting yourselves free, that's what I have been doing for the past 25, 30 years on stage. Letting myself free. Whether people like it or not, if they don't, fuck them. If they do, please come to my concerts. But the thing is, it's because of you guys. You taught me how to do that. And just hat off. And watching this uh, film tonight, it just brought it all back because, of course, I never threw any of my albums away. <laughs> I should have. No, 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 no. I never lost them either. They were the only albums I never lost. Um, my question is: <laughs> Yeah. Keep over the last, uh, over the tour during the touring times, what did you guys do to let go? Yeah. <laughs> let go of what? <laughs> let, let go of all the stress. Let go of uh, oh, getting, getting rid of the boss. Cup of herbal tea. I don't. I don't believe you. <laughs> Game of chess. Yeah, that guy. Chest? No chess. Okay, good. Cool. No, I just. Oh, it just moved me so much, and uh, I watched as well um, a short little thing that you guys did, uh, touring-wise, through England, and it was at the very beginning. I think it was done in '69 or '70, mm. and I don't remember the name of it, but um, it showed you privately which very, very few people, there was a video, I don't remember the name of the song, but it showed you each individual privately with families and, and children. Oh, the song remains the same. Yeah, that the was song, it? Yes, yeah. And I just, I just... And all those horses. Yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and hair. <laughs> and and loads, of, loads of hair flowing. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, just 
I'm just so glad you're here. I'm so glad you guys have done that, and Thank you're going to live forever. Thank you. Forever. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you speak for <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question for you, the producer. Um, I understand you are responsible for a lot of the arranging and so forth. I was wondering what you do to decide about what the most important part of a song is, how to make it be the best song it can be. What, what takes priority? Uh, the, well, the song takes priority. Uh, you don't want the arrangement to get in the way of the song. You want it, you want it to present the song and present whatever is the most important thing at the time. If it's uh, if it's instrumental, then you know the instrumental parts have got to be supported by the arrangement and things are going to work. You know, it's it's all about the song. It's, it's all about the end result. Okay, one one more question, then we'll stop. Uh, who's going to? Yeah, okay. Slightly evil question. Uh, is it more fun to play with Jason Bonham than it is with Phil Collins? <laughs> that was actually my fault, I have to tell you. Phil came over from Live Aid, he flew over from England, and he, he said he'd, he'd come on for rock and roll. He said, I'll play rock and roll, but I don't know where the break is. I said, don't worry, Phil, watch me, and I'll, I'll give you a nod where the break comes. Come the break, I completely forgot all about it. <laughs> <laughs> and he played all the way through it. And everybody went, oh, you bastard, you're really the song. <laughs> so sorry, Phil. <laughs> okay, we, we haven't any questions from the girls in the audience, so I think we should test one or two before we finish. Okay. Oh, mine is very quick, actually. It's just actually to really close. Uh, from the moment you had the idea of making this concert to the moment you really finished it, what was your favorite moment or moment that you will always remember, actually. Oh, there's a question. Um, well, I suppose the end was probably one of my favourite moments. Um, <laughs> Be more specific. Because we, <laughs> I realised that we managed to pull it off, you know, in no uncertain terms. Um, musically, I think Kashmir was a, a bit of a highlight. I mean, it sounds... It sounds pretty good here on the film. It sounded bloody awesome on stage, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> you could feel it. Jason was, again, one of my, a highlight for me. Um, not only, I mean, can you imagine? Not only is the son of John Bonham, so he's got his father to live up to, every drummer who's there, from all the bands, you know, half the big bands in the world, all their drummers were there that night. You know, probably thinking, it could have been me. <laughs> 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 he really, he just fought it off. He took chances. He didn't just make it. He took. He really went for it, and that just what made the whole. That inspired us to play even even better. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Okay, one more, one more. Just down the front here. Have we got the microphone? Hello? You're enjoying this. I know we can stay longer if you just find it. else to do, huh? Um, we got, yeah, there's one more down here. We got, oh, sorry. Okay, we'll take two oh. more. Hello? We'll Hello. start up there. Okay. Um, Mr. John Paul Jones, I was just wondering what did happen to the orange jams because I was missing the letters A and N. That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I have, my, I have my theory. Um, look at the orange amplifiers. Um, I don't think it's fair to. I think something should be left in the mythology and yeah. um, not be fully explained. It's just like the symbols, right? Is that me? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, well, symbols have potency. Um, I think. No, um, you're glad he's here, aren't you? Yeah. I'm glad. Look, if you look at a Ferrari, if you look at a Ferrari, and you know it's a fantastic motor car. I don't particularly need to see how all the engine works. I just look at that thing. I accept that. Okay, we've got one, definitely one final question. I know that this lady's put her hand up several times, so if we can bring the microphone down, and this will be the last question. In the second row. Yeah. Okay, thank, you. thank you so much. Um, just want to know, thank you, Can we expect anything more? And you too? Possibly. If not, then you'll have them. This is too late.
I'm just constantly inundated with reunion questions. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was but, a bit However, <laughs> yeah, now, there were always plans to do more music uh, with them, and if I can fit it in quickly while everybody's, you know, because they, they have their day jobs to go to, <laughs> and um, if, we, if we can all fit it in, yes, we'd like to do some more, and, and it was always planned. Thank you.